Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, depending on where you're watching this from. Welcome to another special edition of Book Passages Conversations with Authors. I'm your host, Paula Farmer. Thank you for supporting today's event and all our events coming up. We really appreciate it. We know you have lots of options these days and a lot of obligations as well. So we really appreciate the support in this way, uh, as well as purchasing today's featured books um, from Book Passage or from a good local independent bookstore. We'd love to support Indie and Local. Um, so I originally hosted these two wonderfully talented and inspiring authors uh, in September in person. And honestly, they were so fantastic. I asked them, could we pivot and also do something virtually so that we could reach so many more people like you today? And not only today, but as soon as we're done, this goes into the uh, Book Passage YouTube archives and lives on forever to an audience every day. Um, and uh, speaking of YouTube and Book Passage archives, please take the time to subscribe. Um, it really is quick and easy for you, but it means so much to us and we really appreciate it. Also remember audience members, you don't have to just watch or listen, you can actually actively participate by putting in questions and comments in the chat. And we will get to them, we promise we'll get to them before the end of today's uh, discussion between the authors. Um, so I mentioned two books, they're very different, um, but the talent is just as wonderful between the two authors. Um, and first up, I'm gonna talk about Boomerang Boomerang by Achi Obeha. It's a unique and inspiring bilingual poetry collection written in a bold, mostly gender-free English and Spanish that addresses immigration, displacement, love and activism. Um, it's divided into three sections and uh, you'll get something different out of each of those sections. Achi Abeja is a Cuban American writer activist, author of The Tower of Antias, which was nominated for a Penn Faulkner Award and other honors. Her novels include uh, Ruins and Days of Ah, which was a Los Angeles Times Best Books of the Year. She is a writer and editor for Netflix and she lives in the Bay Area. And next up is The President and the Frog, a novel by Carolina de Robertis. This is not only one of the most unique and intriguing titles, uh, but the story itself is imaginative, poignant, and profound. It's equal, full of wit and humor, as well as showing the resilience of the human spirit. Um, you're going to love it. You need this. You need both these books for very different reasons, but you need them. So please help me welcome our two guest authors today, Carolina and Achi. Hi. Thank, Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Paula. Thank you so much. Hola, Achi. Hola, Carolina. ¿Cómo estás? Bien, Regia. Qué lindo verte. <laughs> welcome to everybody. It's so good to see you, Achi. Um, and to be in this space with you again after doing again, <laughs> I know <laughs> again, and um, uh, I'm so excited. Um, I've said this to you before, but to say it in this space and with this circle of listeners and potential future viewers, that um, I have been so excited for your book, Boomerang Boomerang, um, for years as I've heard you talk about and discuss the vision and seen pieces of poetry from it just kind of gleam out radiantly into the world piece by piece and then to see them in this collection has just been so glorious it's, it's such a phenomenal book and um i'm well, so I feel, excited i feel very similarly about president frog which as you know i affectionately refer to as a commandante in the lemur <laughs> um, <laughs> Indeed. because I, I too have been listening to it and thinking about it with you for uh, a few years i noticed we're in each other's acknowledgments uh, <laughs> wow wow that's right well yeah yes you're certainly in mine that's amazing yeah, you're absolutely in mine yeah um so right. even though the books are very different they are linked by our friendship and and love and admiration and i i love that yeah yeah oh i love that too it's like the books 
uh, it's almost as if the books in in their in the course of their coming into the world were already in community with each other. Right. Right. I mean, yeah. we, you know, just to be transparent about the fact, clearly we're in literary community, we're friends, our kids love each other, you know. Yeah, my kids um, think of your kids as cousins. My kids call you Tia Achi. And <laughs> it is, I mean, we're chosen family. I just may as well be public about it, right? Yeah. Um, I was thinking a lot about your kids while trick-or-treating today. I was thinking oh. they should have been here. It's like a half a pound per kid of candy. Oh God, they would have loved it. Don't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell them they missed it. Um, so you know, um, there is that chosen family, and that, and that, and that, and it's an amazing thing when that can overlap with genuine literary um, connection and intellectual exchange. And intellectual because... exchange and discourse, and yeah, yeah. No, it's I. This is you are one of my people when it comes to work that I do, the writing that I do. Yeah. Um, I I can't imagine actually anything going into the world without at least having a conversation under the table with you you know it's just um you're you're part of my creative universe it's amazing and on, uh, hugely humbling especially because i also your reputation preceded you before i met you um and your work also broke ground um you know decades before i was published broke ground for people like me to be able to be possible to be a queer latina writer and have a space um in the literary culture so um amazing you know and then here we are and yes always like that we you know and i think even making visible here that this is part of how books are born right writing oh, yeah. a book writing a novel, writing a poetry collection, it is a solitary act, but it is also, it can very much be an act that takes place in community and where we can hold each other um, and hold each other's books through it. So um, you're Absolutely. one of the first Absolutely. readers for this book too. So yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> okay. are, you gonna, are you gonna share a little present yeah. frog with us? So with all of that, I'm gonna read a little from this book. So um, this is my fifth novel, The President and the Frog. And it is uh, just a tiny bit of background before I read. It is um, loosely inspired by a real president of Uruguay, which is my country of origin, um, Jose Mujica, who, was, who has been a sort of you know, beacon of progressive hope uh, in Uruguay and beyond, but who also was a guerrilla revolutionary um, who endured solitary confinement and really brutal conditions during the Uruguayan dictatorship. And um, I lived in Uruguay for part of the time that he was president, and I read in the paper one day an interview where he mentioned that he, in part, kept his sanity during that brutal time when all seemed lost and he was sort of isolated in a hole under a dictatorship. Um, he, in part, preserved his sanity by striking up conversations with a frog. And this just sort of stayed with me. And I thought, you know, what, what if we could hear those conversations? I, they, they opened for me burning questions about resilience and about um, the secret ways that we become ourselves or shape a meaningful life against the odds um, and commit ourselves to a better, brighter world. So this is from the beginning of the book, from the first chapter. Um, the book goes back and forth between the time in the 70s when he's in that hole and a contemporary moment where he is, it's 2016, it's November 2016, there's just been a disastrous election in the north and um, he's receiving a reporter from Europe to um, interview him. Let me start in his memories. Talk had made him what he was. Talk was his unique gift and his inheritance. He was born to a nation of talkers, a nation where you stopped by for a minute and stayed for hours, chatting over wine or whiskey or sherba mate. Conversation threads and weaves the world. This was an element some foreign reporters didn't understand. They rushed through their list of questions and didn't know how to deepen the rhythms of exchange. Some reporters showed up so starry eyed or bent on their own ends that it was clear from the beginning they would only go so deep. So the ex-president kept them on the surface and sent them on their way. Most of the time when that happened, the reporters seemed content. This woman though, already seemed different. He could tell just from her gait as she walked up the path. She seemed to have the listening gift, which would make for a different kind of interview the thought of which, in fact, gave him a sense of the ground falling beneath his feet, though he didn't show it on the outside, trained revolutionary that he was. And what was it, anyway, this shaking inside? It wasn't fear, exactly, but something else, the prick of temptation, the possible tapping at shells that might want to crack open after all, because who was he kidding? Why pretend? 
Of course, he still had places that were shut inside and had not yet been poked and found, buried secrets no interview had touched. Of course, he had parts of the long story he'd never really told, no matter how many thousands of interviews he'd given so far. Obviously, he did. How else could it be? Now, come on. Would an old gorilla like him really lay it all bare? Sure, he laid it bare. He told it all. He'd been the most honest president in the world, infamous for saying whatever popped into his mind as long as it was true. But even so, he had layers and then more layers, as did any human being. There were intimate versions of your own story you did not give the world. The deeper ones, the strange ones, the ones you yourself drew life from but did not quite fully understand. And that was the problem with the listening gift. It widened the whole channel and next thing you knew you were waxing on, you were roaming out. You didn't know what you would say next or what would crack open. The woman was in front of him now, holding out her hand to shake in that first world way, her face warm, her cameraman just behind her. To his absolute surprise, the ex-president felt the past rise inside him with a roaring fullness. And even though he knew he couldn't tell it, he had never told it, would never tell it, knew it couldn't be conveyed in words. He felt it push alive inside him, that closed up secret, that deep sea story from 40 years ago, the one that could answer half their questions in one swoop, the story of the frog. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love that uh, that intro because it uh, it sets you up and it doesn't set you up for what's coming. You mm -hmm. know, that book is so full of surprises. The more you go into it and the more you read. Um, but I feel like uh, that just puts us right there in, in a really sweet way. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I also noticed both our offices are yellow. Yes, I put both <laughs> in our offices, which are <laughs> yellow paint and bookshelves and lots white, of books. Yeah, white bookshelves even. Actually, we've got this yeah. really. I had not parallel. even really thought about that. I've been in your office a thousand times. I don't think <laughs> I really thought about it. Hmm. That's pretty. It's pretty. It's pretty incredible. We have these matching, <laughs> matching literary spaces in our homes. It's beautiful. Um, so will you read to us from Boomerang Boomerang? I will. Um, the first piece I'm going to read actually is um, something I wrote shortly after the massacre at Tree of Life mm. um, in uh, Pennsylvania, which was about, I guess, about a year or two ago now. Um, and um, it, it was, a, I, I don't know if you remember the massacre, but 11 people died um, in a shooting at a synagogue. Um, and the guy who shot them all uh, was screaming anti-Semitic um, stuff the whole time. And when he was um, arrested, he, he actually just said, I, I just want to kill all Jews. Um, it was very blatant and very sort of, um, I don't know. So he was proud of his deed, I guess. Um, anyway, the piece is called in response to the murder of 11 Jews, including a 97-year-old said to be a Holocaust survivor who wasn't. If they preferred tea with honey, take a step back. If they watched police procedurals, if their ankle throbbed or their hands swelled and they didn't complain or they did, take another step back. If they missed being in love with its anticipations, a hand caressing the small of their back, take a third step. Or maybe they'd forgotten, held it like a souvenir postcard from long ago, colors faded. If they had children and their children had children and their children's children had children, or maybe they hadn't forgotten, bend knees, but found instead a love deeper than love, phantomless and devout. If they were simply going through the motions, which now gave them a warm and glowing contentment that came to them like a breath, bow. If they recalled the headlines from those other times, bend knees, the hours volunteering at a soup kitchen 
writing pen pals in uniform, bow. Mm -hmm. If they remembered fear, if they'd grown immune, so saturated with it, it had transformed into a fourth prayer. If they understood what happened when it happened, if their hearing caught the stranger's cry, if they pondered for an instant, if they were dreaming or confused, fall down. The wind blows, the rain falls, the sick are healed, the bound released. Gather exiles from the four corners of the earth onto the land, reassemble here, body upon body. Mm. Um, this next piece uh, is called The Ravages. Time is free. A sunset ignites its own fire. Wonderful. The door is the door. Yes, we connect to the radio via the internet. It's a great day. A wall phone call, standing up, feet on the ground, while someone follows us around. We can only look at it that way and dream about how to become a fitness guru. In the meantime, someone dies on the corner, right at the intersection, and everyone tries to figure out whether it's okay to cross. A great day today. Don't cry. Don't cry, someone shouted. They were masked, so who could tell who it was? The wind was blowing, all four winds, whirling around the closed newsstand, whipping up the sand. It stings, it stings and stings. These are children, their faces covered, but it's still a great day today. A wall phone call, standing up, feet on the ground. We're being followed. Yes, we can see the footprints, heads poking out behind the wheel, but too low. We laugh and wonder, they too dream about how to become a fitness guru with joint and muscle resolution. Someone died today right on the corner and someone who knows who cried out, don't cry, don't cry. This is the rifle that started it all at the church. Each pull of the trigger like medicine, like magic, no one knows better. We still have no idea if there are boxes full of stuff somewhere and runners in the forest. Symptoms continue in millions, kids too. It's a great day today. A wall phone call to no one while they follow us so slow. We can see them in the parking lot, the ambulance, the paramedics, masked too, and shouting in a chorus now. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. That's all I got. <laughs> I think we should start with you since you read first. And uh, <laughs> I think this book is so different from your last book. Your last book, Antoras, was this uh, very um, emotional, I think for me anyway, um, story about these five women who fall in and out of love and create community and find love during a time of dictatorship in uh, the Southern Cone in Uruguay. And so there's that connection mm -hmm. and of course it's Uruguay but it's the Cantoras was very much grounded mm -hmm. you know like yeah. it was it was about the possibilities of things but it was still grounded in in real places and real things and real conversations and though this starts from a place of historical truth it really flies, it soars, it jumps up and says, hey, um, I'm, I'm taking a lot of license here and I'm going uh, where no other Uruguayan lesbian has ever gone before. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly so. <laughs> it's fine, no. yeah, I mean, who else has gotten into Mojica's brain? So, so, so no, I want you to talk about the transition and also how you gave yourself permission to, yeah. to inhabit a very live person. Yes, who is actually alive and a public- Alive, person. very and much so, alive. Yeah. yeah. And thoroughly documented, yes. Yes. It's definitely, um, yes, quite a leap to take. Um, and the kind of leap I think that is, that often uh, male writers are more likely to take. <laughs> Yeah. You know, kind of stepping in and saying, oh, right into the center of this public person. Uh, what does that look like? Certainly, I mean, to start with that part, I think um, I, I knew 
I knew that the the seed of it was absolutely this this real person, um, the complex the complexity and layers of whose life I find you know endlessly interesting and intriguing. But that fundamentally, I didn't envision this book as really being a biography of Mujica. Those books exist in Spanish um, and in translation other languages, not in English, but they that, that documentation exists. Right. Um, but I wanted to write a kind of, um, you know, imaginary exploration. And that meant it had to be a wild leap. Um, and so part of how I gave myself permission was thinking about what some of the ways are of um, unhinging the story from the sort of the empirically real from the accepted so the the, the narrator is actually unnamed and right. the country is unnamed so it is absolutely based on Uruguay and there's the yerba mate and there's there's elements of Uruguay and Uruguayan history that are there um, but it's also a little bit at a slant it is an unnamed country and we do have this these traditions in Latin American literature and in other literatures of um what we call the global south, um, like Salim Haddad's Papa and right. um, Mosin Hamid's um, Exit West, and then El uh, At Night We Walk in Circles, you know, books that, um, that are definitely based on a particular country's history, but that unname the country in order to give a little bit more creative freedom to, to explore the truth um, in a different way with a different, with a different proximity and intimacy. So that was part of it, um, in terms of in terms of in terms of leaping in, and then in terms of it is a really different book from the last book. Cantoras it's totally a different book, and and but also you know I think the unnamed country part is not um, like that big a deal. In fact, I I, uh. I appreciated it not being unnamed because uh, you could project some of this into other places if you needed to, uh, in order to make it more real for you. You know, you could just. Well, that's the other part. Yeah. Right. This, but, yeah. But Mujica yeah. is still Mujica, and he's very identifiably so. Right. And I mean, that because, was because of... let's be honest, there aren't that many no, former no. No. mandatories from from Latin American countries that are both progressive um, and still yeah. appreciated. A lot of progressives For become sure. real assholes once right. their, their tenure is up. So he's also very he as a figure is very unique and anomalous and absolutely in, in, in that way um, and in other ways as well right there's just one guy who got called the poorest president in the world because he gave his money to charity and and stayed in his little chosa yeah, he never lived in the presidential palace no he lived in this ramshackle little farmhouse right. which is where he was at the beginning of the story and the, you know he's like the journalist and he hated why you lived suits. this way yeah. So all and so why do you live this way? What does it mean to hold political power and still remain humble and down to earth? That's a very that's very much something that's about him. So that was like this. But it's the story of the frog that's going to explore that thematically within the world of this book. So I felt like with this book, you know, for me, you know, I'm five novels in and you've written, I think, five novels. Six? A, a lot of books. You've written what I would call, okay, here in the Bay Area, we would say hella books. You've written hella books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and when you, when you, I, for me, I feel like certainly the first three novels really taught me what it is to write a novel and how to write a novel for myself, at least, because, you know, everyone's process is so unique. Um, and, um, and I think that for me, it's really about listening to what the book wants from us. Um, and allowing aesthetic decisions, stylistic decisions to really rise up out of the material itself and what the book itself wants to become. Um, and that might mean stretching. Like for me, it might mean stretching my wings a little bit. Like if the prose needs to be leaner, if the prose needs to be more lyrical, if, if we're operating in the realm of the parable, if it needs to be an immediate first person, then I go out and I read those the works like that, that have mastered these elements so that I can get more proximity to them and, 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 and imbibe them to, to do service, to, to do whatever service the book needs. So with Cantoras, there was a lot of physical detail to the city that they were in, you know, like Montevideo, the specifics, this street, that moment, you know. Um, so it was it was very rich with with detail where, where you would really be in that time and place. And then here it's sort of, I'm, I, I was hoping, but also every character was really specifically drawn and very. Yeah. Like you could do, you know, a dossier on each character. <laughs> could you? Really, That's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, my my book club is reading Cantoras. No, um, really, for real, for real, for real. Wow. I'm not making wow. that up. 
But I mean, you could oh. you could do a dossier on each of the yeah. characters, and they they really stand up as as unique mm -hmm. individuals, you know. Um, and I think in this case, it's more suggestive, and we fill in mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. he is by whatever knowledge we have of Mojica, what we imagine the knowledge is of Mojica, or what we imagine a president of some Latin American country, uh, uh, you know, would might be like in their post uh presidential existence if they're not in jail mm -hmm, mm -hmm, or assassinated right. <laughs> the right. usual. indeed indeed well i think that's i mean i think that's the piece about um stylistic d divergence uh stylistic range um i think f you know for me i feel like it's um one of the things I love about being a writer, being any kind of artist, is the, the capacity to be free, to really be of service to the work. And so I think sometimes, especially um, those of us who are writers who carry marginalized identities, there can be more pressure to write in a similar way from book to book to book. Um, and I think I think that's very real. Um, Absolutely. And I, you know, and I think that um sometimes and i and I, I think gender is one really big axis of that like men get really sort of oh you've written many different kinds of books look how much freedom right. you have look how much ambition you have and then a woman is like well what are you doing and i yeah. think that's not in any way you don't seem to land what's that you don't seem to land you're yeah you don't seem you're to land fighting about yeah you're flitting about right isn't that interesting yeah. how gendered that that can become yeah absolutely and I've, I think, I've gotten that too you do yeah. journalism and you do poetry and you do novels and you do things. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so what are you doing? And yeah. so who you are know, you really? Right. And so I think it's very exciting and interesting to push up against those kinds of boundaries and limitations and allow, you know, certainly there could be queer Latina women writers who have their project and it's writing 10 books that are in a very similar vein. That's a beautiful career. And I will be there to celebrate that career too. But if the career feels, if it feels right to write into many different kinds of spaces and styles and voices, if that feels like what will best serve the work or what a writer feels like they have to explore and contribute, um, then I want a world where there is room for that um you know for for all writers and for all narrative um axes and perspectives so I, I think that's a really interesting um space to think Absolutely. about and i also think we could take that theme and turn it to your work too because yeah. this is because this is a collection of poetry and it's a bilingual collection right. of poetry which is its own extremely exciting thing especially because you are also um an extremely accomplished literary translator and a, a leader in the field of literary translation, as well as, um, you know, your own creative writing and your own right. Um, and so in terms of uh, speaking of being multi genre. Right? <laughs> and so, um, and so having that literary translator sensibility um, and writing this book that is both, that is fully inhabiting both languages seems so exciting to me, um, as well as the genre shift of, you know, your last book was a collection of short stories. Before that, there was a novel. Before that, another novel. Um, yeah. And the next one will be a novel. And you're working on a novel right now, yeah. right? Which is right. a really exciting project um, that I can't wait to see. So <laughs> what, what can you tell us about about that journey journey in terms of um yeah aesthetic and stylistic range well this book had a very um sort of unexpected uh journey into being um i don't think i ever imagined um really publishing a book of poems i mean i've i've always written poetry poetry is something that i love i mean every single day i i i read i read poetry part of my sort of like it's a warm-up exercise you know for for mm -hmm. writing for me uh, is to sit down and and uh and and read poetry and i i frequently you know will revisit poets i like um mm -hmm. you know um and then i go on binges of new things um but um, though i've always written poetry and i have this great love and this deep admiration for um poets i um I really had always concentrated on prose and really um, thought of myself very much as a proser. And what happened was a friend of mine 
uh, named Lawrence Schimmel, who um, has a poetry imprint that he runs out of uh, Madrid in uh, New York, um, Midsummer's Night's Press. Um, he used to, when I lived in Chicago, he would come to Chicago every year from Madrid and he would spend, you know, like a week or 10 days at my house while he was busy, you know, attending sci-fi conferences in Madison, Wisconsin, or, uh, you know, the, the book expo in Chicago or whatever. Yeah. And every year he would uh, press me about poetry because he knew I wrote poetry and we had gotten to the point where we, you know, would talk a lot about poetry. And so he read stuff and um, finally, he, he said, I really think there's something here. And uh, he, you know, he asked me to, to like look over the work. So I literally just handed him a pile of spiral notebooks that like dip back all the way to high school. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> all the poetry in the spiral notebooks or was there also the angsty journaling and all yeah, it was, I mean, there were, you know, little drawings and stupid little notes and shit like that, but it was, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was very, you know, table of contents and everything in the spiral notebooks because they were meant to be poetry notebooks. So the first two pages were always blank and I would fill them up as I. And you home. started those in high school. Yeah, I, in high school. I am filling spiral notebooks with poetry in high school. Yeah, in high school. Wow. wow. And okay. Lawrence uh, picked out a, a quick selection and he he put together a chapbook, uh, which ended up being, this is what happened in another life, mm -hmm. in our other life, uh, which he published and which to my amazement um, did very well. And um, I mean, did very well critically, did very well for sales. It's his biggest seller. And um you know, it gave me a little bit more confidence to sort of think about poetry in a different way. Um, I'd spent like three years working on a novel that didn't quite work out, although I think I'm going to go back to it after I'm done with the one I'm working on now because I've had more time to think and sort of resolve some issues. Um, but I, I needed to like refresh in my palette and I started just playing around with putting together, you know, something. Um, and then I did a, a, an essay for a wonderful book called Passing that came out from Beacon. And my whole experience with Beacon Press was so extraordinary. I was just a contributor to this book, but um, they, they were so warm, they were so welcoming, they were so incredibly supportive. And I put together a, a, a first sort of draft of this thing um, and sent it off, uh, you know, like unexpectedly, I just sent it and said, what do you guys think, you know? And uh, to, again, to my surprise, they said, uh, yeah, let's do it. And then suddenly I had this uh, poetry project. I remember calling my agent, I remember calling Jonah and saying, hey, I just did this and Beacon. And he was like, you did what? <laughs> you know, get back to that novel. That novel, <laughs> damn it. I'm um, waiting for you to get me a novel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I hear you were with, um, multiple pots on the stove that yeah. were genre. So I use a lot of different metaphors for thinking about the creative process. And I, I can I throw one out at you and see how this lands? Let's see how it goes. Because it's like, I think of sometimes when I think of like pots on the stove, I think of it being like an enormous, the creative process, the, the creative realm is, can be like an enormous um, industrial stove with, you know, my, my, my kitchen at home is like four burners, right? Two by two. Oh, I've been there. Four, Yes, you know, you have cooked. <laughs> I have cooked things. in your kitchen. <laughs> yeah, in my kitchen. Yes, undefeated black beans. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so, um, so, uh, but like a five by five, like so many burners, right? And that sometimes like that novel that you just said that you let go of and, but now you think you might return to it. It's almost like it's like four rows back in a yeah. pot and you might pull it back. And sometimes when we're writing a novel, it's like, it's, it's, it's a front burner. Or it takes up two front burners and it's all we can stir. And sometimes you have more than one thing going. And I'm curious whether that kind of metaphor resonates for you. And I, and circling back to what you were saying about Jonah was waiting for your novel. Your novel wasn't not simmering but you also had this other thing simmering, or no? Yes, I mean, it, the novel that I put aside, it's the first time I've actually put aside a project. Oh, really? I, it's painful. It was for me when it happened. Oh was my it God, I, it, was, it was unbearable. I, and I was so it's depressed sick. about it. It was just, uh, it was like gut-wrenching. Um, and it took me back, I, I, Christina Garcia, who's a very good friend of both of ours, 
I remember after Dreaming in Cuba, and she uh, she started a novel, and I remember talking to her like a year and a half into it, and she said, "I couldn't do it. I had to put it aside." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the very idea of having to put aside a project was like un inconceivable to me. I just could not imagine doing that, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, and I. I was terrified of, of that block. And I think in some ways I push myself sometimes to finish stuff um, because of that experience of watching Christina respond to that and, and you know, just the, the pain and the anguish that it caused her. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. when I put this aside, I needed a very serious palate cleanser and it had to be something that wasn't another novel. Uh -huh. I didn't want to run into those same issues but with different subject matter and different characters, you know, I mean, and when I say those same issues, I don't even know what issues I was imagining, but because it was taking the same, you know, it was steering in the same pot. Yeah. Right. You know, stirring in the same pot, right. It was too similar a stir. It was, it was like, it. yeah. And I just didn't want to risk it. it. I needed to do something else that would put me in a different place. Yeah. Now yeah. that I've been in a different place, I can, think about that. In fact, there are days when I'm working on the novel that I'm working on, which I'm very excited about and I'm very interested in and which yeah. I've done a lot of research for, that right. I actually get excited about the next novel. Of course, I'm not yeah. like you where I have a list of the next five novels. I haven't always been that way. <laughs> I, I'm having a weird life moment where I write this moment, have like the next four books Super I know. I, like, I walked into your office and I saw that list. I was like, <laughs> Jesus H. Christ. Okay, you know? for people listening, it's right over there. That wall has a list and <laughs> bubbles and visions and maps of those four books. But you know what? I will I have to say what that what it took for that to get born was a year of pandemic working full time with the kids right. at home and you, you took some time off where I felt like I would never write again you know? right you <laughs> and, and in some ways you, you let you, you let all that stuff germinate and all the ideas kind of come to the flow they weren't interrupting another flow well that's a great way of putting it yeah 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 so that's an interesting thing if anyone listening happens to be a writer or a person engaged in a creative creative work of some kind you know that 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 at least it sounds like for both of us like there's can be the feeling you know, this novel isn't working right now. I'll not, you know, it's not going to work. Nothing will work. Or, you know, I can't write. I'm in survival mode with the pandemic. Right. I'll never really write. That that sometimes something else is happening, like germination, or you know, you just keep going. Poco a poco se va lejos, and there's something on the other side. Also, everybody has their own pace. I mean, I often joke that you and Christina, you know, for every book you guys put out, I put out a poem. <laughs> but the truth is, the truth yeah, but is, those poems are some <laughs> poems. Oh, but the point is that everybody has their own pace and everybody has to do, they have to follow their own rhythm. It's just, it. I mean, I, I right now in my life, I couldn't do what you can do in terms of the many things that you, you, you know, juggle. I mean, I'm juggling other shit, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, you have a very specific system in place, let's say. You know, and, you know, Christina's like her kids out of the house and she's, you know, uh, you know, not worried about economics right now because she's retired. And um, and so, you know, every two minutes she's letting us know about some new project. I mean, That's I feel like beautiful. I wake up every morning to Christina having something new. Isn't it amazing? Um, I it's know. unbelievable. It's she's like going through this amazing flowering. I know it's incredible. I mean, you just mentioned, you know, her first groundbreaking novel, Dreaming in Cuban, and she just announced that next year it's going to be staged it's in be, Berkeley at the play. Yeah, theatrical oh. adaptation in Berkeley. Yeah, and that yeah. has been really cool to see the way in which she's created plays out of two of her books, The Lady Matador Hotel, and uh, uh, the novel King I love, Cuba. and King of Cuba, which is a phenomenal novel, which yeah. was one of my inspirations with the president and the frog. Like talk about taking on like, you know, that's the right. of that's right. head of state and helping yourself to that. And I said that that was kind of a masculine writer thing to do, but Christina is the only woman writer I can think of who has really, really done that. Right. Uh, you guys did it very differently though. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's the thing you can, so you can draw inspiration 
from from creative work that already exists and have that Absolutely. kind of ecstasy of influence and still let it become let it have an alchemy within you to make something all your own it doesn't right. mean that you'll be you know people talk about the anxiety of influence oh then it'll be like a copy of that person you know what if what if i get influenced by reading too much tony tony morrison we should all be so lucky uh, yeah we can say, <laughs> give me another example that's not a good one that's, right? that always works it always works always works that always, always works. good i'm rereading yeah. her from the beginning right now i'm at oh, really Really? I you met Sula. Yeah, so I've got a way to, yeah, just rereading, just start over the bluest eye, Sula, and I'm going to read all the novels in order. Um, what a great idea. Yeah. You know, I've yeah. done, I've done that I before. Am still, yeah. I am still in the National Book Award uh, madness. You know, I'm on the translation jury this That's, year. You judge. That's a huge yeah. service. Massive uh, reading. We had 174 books and like, I don't know how many languages, like gazillion. But now we're in a serious rereading part um, oh. for the for the final. We we came out with the shortlist, wow. and uh, it is uh, it, rereading something that you've just recently read is also yeah. very curious. You look at things. I I mean I, I was thinking, how, why am I rereading this? I mean this is I just read it, and yeah. but the second read is a it's a it's a much more like microscopic read in some That's weird amazing. way. Well, I mean, absolutely, right? The microscopic level becomes more visible because often the first time we read something, we're we're experiencing the story if it's if it's narrative, right? The right. Story, what's going to happen or even like the synagogue poem you just read, this devastating poem, like the impact, just the emotional impact of it. But then you you said microscopic, like the microscopic line level suddenly mm -hmm. become more visible to us when we reread i mean i think that's a you know a powerful thing about the way we can experience yeah what made you decide to do tony, tony morrison from the beginning um i've been wanting to do it uh you know since she passed um she's one of the writers who's most important to me absolutely um and the first person i had done that before um i did it uh eight years ago the first author i did that with was james baldwin and i decided i want to read all his novels in order um, in a condensed period of time to the extent possible with kids and responsibilities and everything, um, but in a condensed, like in a year, I called it the year of Baldwin. Um, and and it, it was it was pretty extraordinary because, you know, when you read all of someone's novels in order, you get a real sense of like their career arc. I mean, you can almost feel well, and their growth. the person behind the book growing personally and aesthetically, mm -hmm. creatively, you feel how you know, how the, how they're preparing for the next book, even maybe without knowing it. Um, and so, and I did that with Elena Ferrante, some of the books I'd already read. So I went back for a reread. Um, I tried to do it with Bolaño and I have to say, I love Bolaño, but that's too much Bolaño. Yeah, <laughs> the, I, I, I have never understood the, the, the thing with Bolaño. It's like, I, 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 I like love him. A lot about his work, but I don't. It's it's both the the the, the just a sheer volume of, of 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 pages that that would be, but also the bleakness, the bleakness of his yeah. No, I mean that's just it. Yeah, yeah. And I've I've read him in English <laughs> and in Spanish because right. he has an extraordinary translator in Natasha Wimmer. He does, and, absolutely. Yeah, and, I mean she's just unbelievable. She's an amazing and, translator, and yeah. so you know uh, it's not like you're, you're reading something you're going well, but you know little the translation sucks. So I, you know, no, it's all good. English and Spanish is all good, but I, I am still like, I can do him and I appreciate him, but the magic there has never struck me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I, I'm like, well, is resistant. Bologna resistant. I think, you know, there's an interesting alchemy between us and texts and um, our experiences as readers. It's also the timing with things is really mm -hmm. different. Um, you know, um, the timing of, of when we, find ourselves oh, absolutely. In book. Uh, but it's interesting to even talk a little bit just now about our reading habits and our reading interests um, uh, and the way that we read because it kind of also lays bare the way as writers ultimately we are passionate readers it's what right. brought us to the page it's what brought us to writing and um, and it's deeply part of our process as writers is to absolutely read and, read and read and so also people who are listening today or in the future who are who identify as readers or as passionate readers ultimately we're part of that same tribe oh absolutely tribe absolutely. of the book yeah. you know and there and there are writers that i constantly go back to i mean there are things yeah. that i am always rereading i i actually used to carry a very weathered copy of michael and dodgy's handwriting 
in my backpack at all times. Uh, and then of course I discovered the Kindle and now it's in there um, and 300 and other third books. But, you know, um, like I love Percival Everett. I don't think I've missed a single book he's oh, really? ever written. I, I am like the biggest fan of his work. And it's not something that I would normally imagine that I would like, but I love his experimentation. I love his spirit of, you know, adventure and like going into all these places. I mean, he he just is, he, his format, his structures, everything always surprises me. And I'm always really happy to read him. They're so... I've read him in order, but not on purpose. You know what I mean? I've read him and order. over time and not in that sort of condensed style. But you're right, right. right. No, I've read him in order, but not yeah. in that order. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I think Kato, there's a there's a question for you. In okay. The chat. Do you want to read it, and then I'll read the question for you? Sure. It says the president of the frog is laced with a lot of wit and humor, um, which is different for you, especially compared to Cantoras. How different or challenging was it for you to incorporate these elements? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, wit and humor in particular. Yeah, there is a lot of humor in this book, and and that was another piece of it too. Is that you know. This is a, a, a man in brutal con solitary confinement. There's trauma here, right? He's been tortured. Um, he feels all hope is lost. And yet I didn't want to linger in the trauma. I really wanted to be a story about resilience. And, um, uh, you know, I've written other books that go go into the, you know, the, the trauma of that, beginning with my first book, you know, The Invisible right. Mountain. Yeah. Which, you know, three generations of Uruguayan history, including that that era. So I'd been with the era for a very long time and for various books. So I, so, you know, I was ready to kind of, come at it from a different angle. Um, in terms of, you know, I feel like humor is something that I wish that I had worked with more uh, explicitly earlier, but it was really my fourth novel, Cantoras, where I really feel like I've, I broke open the, the the place from which like humor can really get integrated into my work. It's like, oh, I'm ready. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I don't necessarily agree with the premise of the question because I thought Cantoras had a lot of wit. Yeah, I mean, they're different wits, right? So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I but mean, I think the president of the frog is a little darker. Yeah, right, but, yeah. But, but, there, but, but there, there is a, 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 there is a tone where you are very relaxed and sort of self-effacing with Cantoras that was new. That was, that was, yes, and it was different. And, yes. and it came forward again for the same thing as we were talking about uh, a few minutes ago about, um, you know, stylistic developments and stretching that come out of what you feel that the book needs. Absolutely. Um, and what, what would serve the book. I mean, you know, Cantores is based on queer women who really did live through the dictatorship that I had been listening to deeply right. for 15 years. And I, it just wouldn't have served the book for them to not be joking with each other. And, Absolutely. and that's, yeah. that is part of their joy and resilience. And so I had to write that into their- well, I um, think people who are dynamic. screwed over tend to use humor to survive. Well, it's one of the, one of the Jewish the, the, the humor tool. brilliant, which Absolutely. you know all about as a Jewish Latina writer, you know, and black humor and Absolutely. I mean, so many different, exactly, precisely. And so humor as a survival tool um, was very much part of it. And so once I broke that open, I was like, oh, I don't ever want to go back. <laughs> and I felt like humor is going to be part of this story too but again in a very you know yes in a, in a different tone so thank you for that question and for asking about humor in particular wit I think is different the sort of like oh yeah philosophical repartee and I just felt like I wanted this book to be a human book and to have human emotion but also to be sort of lightly philosophical and and so um so I strove yeah. to weave it in mission accomplished <laughs> thank you yeah <laughs> so for you Achi we have a question speaking of challenges how was it to navigate writing in two languages and mostly gender free, especially in the Spanish? I, I'm going to add, um, especially in the Spanish, this piece about being gender free is so amazing and, and groundbreaking. <laughs> so, Can you talk about that? Yeah, no, that one's a labyrinth. Um, you know, I, the, the notion of navigating in two languages, I mean, I, I do that all the time, and, and you do too. Um, you know, it, it isn't. I don't know how much of a, of a navigation it is like in my own head. Um, you know, I know that when you and I talk not with an audience, we code switch a lot, for example. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're constantly going back and forth and you throw in all your real platense stuff and <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> you, you chat to death and, uh, <laughs> and, and I do my thing. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, we, we love and respect all that stuff and we kind of move through it. But, um, yeah. 
You know, one of the things that I wanted to do with this book was not, not signal the point of origin with the languages. Uh, the book doesn't say what was written in Spanish, what was written in English, although most people have been assuming that it was written in English and then translated in Spanish. That wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. it, you know, different pieces were written in different languages. I didn't want to get into issues of authenticity because I do think that that in some ways devalues a translation. And I think translation has its own value as a creative, um, you know, uh, exercise. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the gender free thing came after all of these poems were written. None of them were actually written with the idea of a gender free um, text. This the the idea of the gender free text came after the book was together, and I realized oh, this is something that could really happen here. And um, in English, it was it wasn't really a big challenge. Um, I write a lot in second person, so that eliminates mm -hmm. gender. Right, right, right. It does. And um, and I think we've gotten very used to they as a, an inclusive pronoun in English. I mean, not everywhere, but it's certainly enough people, certainly most literary people at this point are familiar with the they. I, I think there were other options, other literary options that I personally like more, like March Piercy uh, used per in uh -huh. uh, you know one of her early novels. And yes. uh, June Arnold used uh, na yes. in uh, The Cook and the Carpenter, which yes. is a riot to read aloud because it's yeah. just a, it's, it's it's almost like a, a, a mantra. Yeah, um, I remember. But, and of course, Z there and other. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. All of those. I mean, you know, um, it would have been nice to book. find a new term. Yeah. I guess, the way I think of it. Yeah. You know, not because of the, the, the problem with the third person or anything like that, just to have a new term because it is a new thing, you know, not in the world and not in history, but a new thing in terms of our language. And I, I would want it to, to stand on its own two feet. But anyway. But Spanish was a little bit more of a challenge because Spanish yeah. is based very much on a binary. And um, the, the, the common sort of approach to it in Spanish has been to replace the A for feminine endings and the O's for masculine endings with E. Mm -hmm. And it, usually the way it's been done um, is that the person in the sentence or in the story is who gets neutered who becomes gender free. Right. So you can have a sentence that would be something like this gender free person sits at the feminine table, drinking their masculine coffee, mm -hmm. while flipping their masculine book mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, combing their feminine hair. Yes. Um, and which makes no sense um, to me. I don't understand the, the utility of gender for inanimate things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, yeah. If you really think about it, I mean, who came up with this shit, you know, um, because it, it, yeah. there is nothing innately gendered about las gafas right. you know, or el right. teléfono. It's just an apparatus, it's a gadget. So I ended up just degendering the entire language. Um, and then after I did that, I had a moment of like, whoops, um, because I realized some of the subject matter that I deal with um, really doesn't stand up to being gender free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I have a piece in which I, I mention my mother and it's not just that she's my mother, but that she's a woman who was limited and defined by her condition as a female person right, in right. a particular place and time. Right. And to degender her right. is to eliminate her history, to right. completely erase it and take it out of there. Mm -hmm. You know, in that same poem, I also mentioned Hemingway. And it, you know, it's the same thing. If you eliminate Hemingway's masculinity, you're eliminating his legacy, regardless of what you think about it. I mean, he's kind of the the, the monument to mass, you know, toxic masculinity. Right. But actually, that's an important thing to recognize. Right. I mean, <laughs> right, no, I'm right. serious. I mean, way, yeah, he's he is gendered. The, the the way his legacy exists and was shaped was gendered. Absolutely gendered, and he and he suffered for it. It wasn't like he just wore it like a medal. 
you know, he also suffered deeply because, I mean, he, this was not a happy man. He in a cage of out, you know? Right, 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 um, right, right, right. And, you know, I mean, another poem with Ana Mendieta, again, you know, here was a young woman who entered the art world with this very bold and extraordinary work mm -hmm. that the very masculine art world was very threatened by because it was also work that was very grounded in female things, you know? I mean, as she understood herself to be a woman and, you know, she used her body a lot. She, she used her blood um, and, you know, she was treated like crap because she was a woman. She was treated like crap because she was a young woman of color, but the entry point to disdain and rejection was that she was a woman. Mm -hmm. And to, mm -hmm. again, to make Ana Mendieta not gendered is to then not have a clue why she was marginalized. Right, right. You know, it's like if you if you eliminate race completely from something, if you're totally, you know, racially blind, you're not being not racist. Right. In some right. ways you're confirming racism, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the situation, but it doesn't actually take on the issue of of race to be race blind right that so-called color blindness actually erases right. the experiences of of racism of, of, of racially marked people right um right. so and not all of us have particularly gendered experiences but some of us absolutely do in both directions i mean again using hemingway as an example mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you know i mean i i feel like the non-gender situation is an aspiration rather than a place where we're actually at Mm -hmm. you know also you know it didn't it didn't change my way of speaking you know i did this book but it's very much an intellectual exercise the gender stuff because it's i mean you know uh, sure you know we may say amigas or bienvenides or todes this or you know and we're messing around with but in our day-to-day -day experiences it would be very hard for us to actually make that switch completely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're not there yet yeah. our kids might be Right, right. But I do think you're, you know, you're, you're pushing the edges open. Absolutely. Through art and through art, right? Through yeah. art and with art making in a manner that I think is just so, um, so beautiful and, and, and needed and, you know, aesthetically gorgeous too. So, and there's Paula. There's Paula saying, okay, wrap <laughs> it up. Hello. Thank you both so much for taking a couple of my questions. I feel honored because your questions for each other were just amazing. And <laughs> I know we could go on and on, but I also know you both have children and this is like a national holiday. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I hear. Yeah. Yes. I think Pablo um, has watched seven episodes of Maya and the Tree while I've been prepping for this. <laughs> <laughs> you could do worse, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> well, I also have to apologize to the audience and to Carolina because when I was doing the introductions, I was so caught up in describing President and the Frog, which I'm a big fan of, uh, that I kind of glossed over your well-deserved bio. <laughs> which is long, extensive. Can, and, I, can I tell and... you of all the authors for me to do that to? It's like, Carolina is <laughs> like one of my favorite authors, favorite people. Oh. Uh, so I can't believe it. I was like, wow, I can't believe it. So I'm going to do it now. I don't okay. care what anybody says. I'm doing it. Uh, Carolina Van oh. It's not only special to me because she was one of uh, my first a panelist for one of my early uh, panel special panel events for social justice. She was on the Toni Morrison tribute uh, panel and also on immigration in America, the first one. So very special to me in book passage for that. But as she mentioned, uh, she's originally from Uruguay and um, she has written several award-winning novels um, all of which should be read by all of us, and also Achi's work, just phenomenal. You two are wonderful. Uh, Carolyn is from the Bay Area as well, Oakland, and she teaches at San Francisco State University. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> now I feel better. Like I, I, now I can sleep at night. You know? <laughs> that wasn't bugging me. Like. But before we go, I want to remind the audience that links to both of their books are in our event description below. We encourage you to buy it. I know for a fact that we have some signed copies and we have a lot of book plates from Achi. So thank you for doing that um, when you were in the store earlier. Right. Um, 
Also, just to highlight some upcoming special events, on the second, I'll be hosting the very dedicated, passionate, admirable Zach Norris, who is the director of the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. He'll be discussing his new socially relevant nonfiction book, Defund Fear. Um, and on the 18th, mark your calendars, I'm hosting and moderating a commemorative event for Native Heritage Month. So looking forward to those, but so happy to be in this space with you two. You're wonderful. Thank you for doing this again. No problem. Thank you for having us. We never stop talking. I know, right? <laughs> I'm serious. This will go on now. Right. The conversation will continue in other places and spaces. It's a, yeah. it's a, uh, well, thank you very much for having us, Paula. And this is lovely. Thank you to our book passage Thank audience. you, Paula. <laughs> thank you so much, Paula. Thank you, Book Passage. I mean, thank Absolutely. you, Book Passage, for the way that you have endured and held it down through the pandemic and beyond. And long may all of our indies thrive. Please support Book Passage. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great.